Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. Yesterday, at the end of the broadcast, we concluded with a, a recitation of a pamphlet that was written by a Roman Catholic prelate, Monsignor Seeger, condemning the liberal at attitudes of the governments of the world and suggesting that uh, Count de Camford is the, should have been the divine right ruler of France, that the Pope is the king of kings, and by divine right he picks the kings of the earth, and that Count de Camford should be the, uh, the king of France. And de Camford, who uh, was the, the divine right rightful heir to the throne, according to Monsignor Seeger, under the authority of the Pope, would then arrest the liberal tendencies of France and unite all Roman Catholics, and that the French Roman Catholics would then join ranks and liberate Italy from the liberal government, the republican form of government that had established itself in Italy, and liberate the papal states for the papacy, and restore the temporal power of the pope in Italy. Now, the pope responded, as we might imagine, very favorably to this, uh, to this uh, pamphlet by, uh, by uh, Monsignor Seeger, and with the hopes, obviously, of restoring his temporal power and turning people away from their error. That error is what the Pope calls liberalism. Whenever you hear the papacy use the term liberalism, it refers to those governments that arose the attitude of government of, by, and for the people. That form of government, as we've said so many times, sprang from the Protestant Reformation. It unseated the, the Pope as a temporal ruler and arrogated rulership to the citizens of the country. And they voted their kings in, wrote their constitution, preserving their rights and uh, their liberties to one of the most common constituents of these uh, constitutions these uh, republics, was the guarantee of religious liberty, that a man could worship God according to the dictates of his conscience and not to the dictates of the Pope, and that the papacy hated more than anything. It was that liberalism, as the Pope describes it, that liberated the people from the, the papal boot, the papal heel, and... Uh, the papacy obviously wants to restore his king of kings and lord of lords status. Now, with that out of the way, on page 186, if you're following along, we'll begin in the second full paragraph near the middle of the page. The author asks the question, when does the pope speak ex cathedra? In other words, when does the pope speak infallibly? When he declares the faith, says his followers, what is the faith? It is the law of God, or whatever is founded upon it, or is the necessary consequence of it. Therefore, when the Pope thus gives his approval to the doctrine that it is part of the law of God that kings govern by divine right, it is necessarily a part of the faith and must be believed as such by all the faithful. To reject it would be heresy. Evidently, it is regarded in this light by some of the papists in the United States. If not, wherefore the necessity of republishing in this country and giving prominence in a leading journal to these anti-American opinions of Monsignor Seeger, with the Pope's brief of approval attached? That's right, this, this pamphlet of Monsignor Seeger rousing unity among Catholics in France to overthrow its rightful government, to put Count de Camfort on the throne, and to then wage a crusade against the Republican government of Italy to restore the Pope's uh, temporal power in Italy and 
and in France, was of great concern to American Catholics to support this effort. And in order to gain that support, this pamphlet, Viva Le Roy by Monsignor Seeger, was widely published and distributed in this country, even along with the approval uh, uh, reply that the Pope gave of it. So, so what do we automatically know? That the Roman Catholics in this country are becoming, are being made to become advocates of this movement in France to restore the, the temporal power of the Pope with the hopes that Roman Catholics in America would support the war, even fight in it, and to finance it. But what is insidious about all of this, if the Roman Catholics are encouraged by their priests in this country as a response to this pamphlet to join in unity with the Catholics of France to help overthrow the republics, what are they actually doing to their own government here in the United States? A republic. See, the papacy is subtly, along with his Roman Catholic hierarchy in this country, is subtly setting an example for Roman Catholics that they are to be against governments of, by, and for the people. And that they are to lead this country in a rebellion or in, a, in an attempt to overthrow legitimate Republican forms of gov government elsewhere, and just simply by default, they are to be aggressors against their own government here in the United States. That's the effect that all of this has. Why was it necessary to republish in this country and give prominence in a leading journal to these anti-American opinions of Monsignor Seeger with the Pope's brief of approval attached? And why should the reviewer of this pamphlet venture to declare the identity of opinion between the Catholics of France and America with regard to the form of government to be adopted in France? and the good wishes of the Americans for the success of Count de Camberd, unless, uh, quote, this unity of opinion grows out of the teachings of the Pope, unquote. The reviewer substantially admits this when immediately after avowing this unity, he says that the success of de Camberd, quote, will consolidate the union of Catholics and facilitate at a later period a more thorough cooperation, not only for the restoration, but also for the consolidation and maintenance of the sovereignty of the sovereign pontiff. Unquote. How consolidate the union of Catholics in Europe and America? Manifestly upon the principles avowed by Monsignor Seeger and sent forth with the sanction of the Pope, and how consolidate and maintain the sovereignty of the sovereign pontiff, if not by means of this union of Catholics, based upon these expressed principles of divine right? With what vivid imagination does he look forward to the time when this grand consummation shall be achieved? Then the Pope Quote, will be restored to the plenitude of his power. And he says, with the elder son of the church as our leader, we shall all hasten to expel from the eternal city the miscreants, that is Rome, the miscreants that are now despoiling it. Which means this, says R.W. Thompson, that when the doctrine of the divine right shall become established as a part of the, of, of the faith, and the throne of France shall be held by virtue of it, then the Roman Catholics of the United States will unite with their Roman Catholic brethren in France under the royal banner of Henry V, that is, Mon uh, Count de Cambord, and make war upon Italy. Trained in such a school and imbibing such principles as a part of their religion, how can these men 
help hating with an intense hatred all Republican and popular institutions. And how hard they struggle to impress the laymen of the Roman Catholic Church with kindred principles. They are commanded in the name of the Roman Catholic Church, which asserts that its unity never has been and never can be broken, and which tolerates no disagreement among its members. Each one of them is educated to believe under the penalty of excommunication in an unchanging and unchangeable pope, the same yesterday, today, and forever. All that the pope knows now as revealed, and all that he shall know, and all that there is to know, he embraces all in his intention by one act of faith." Unquote. If faithful, he believes in whatever all the popes have said and done regarding faith and morals, whatsoever Pope Pius IX is now saying and doing, and whatsoever he will and his successors shall do and say in the future. You see how the papacy is impressed upon the minds of Roman Catholics that he is, as it were, God on earth? He says, We're not without advice from European Roman Catholics who have repudiated the doctrine of infallibility and the opposition to liberalism which grows out of it, which admonishes us that these things are worthy of our most serious deliberation. After the decree of papal infallibility was announced, over 12,000 of the citizens of Munich, Germany, in, in Bavaria, presented to the government, through a minister of public worship, an address wherein they protested against it on the grounds of the danger it threatened to their civil and social institutions. That's right. Roman Catholics rose up and wrote a proclamation to their government that this idea of papal infallibility was dangerous to their way of life. Roman Catholics did this. And that, that's the hope that the Roman Catholics will rise up and see what the papacy intends to do in this country and join an opposition to their own pope. This is what happened in Bavaria. And it says a brief extract from it will show how Roman Catholics themselves look upon the impious pretense that the pope stands in the place of God on earth, a doctrine equally inculcated here as there how they shrink with honest apprehension from the usurpations which must follow infallibility if it shall become the universally recognized doctrine of their church, and to what extent it has already given insolence and impunity to an ambitious and dangerous priesthood. Their proclamation concludes thus, quote, the doctrine which the government of your royal majesty has declared dangerous to the political and social foundations of the state is sought to be inculcated with more and more urgency, publicly from the pulpit and in the pastorals and clerical newspapers, as well as, listen to this, privately through letters and the abuse of the confessional. The abuse of the confessional. These Roman Catholic priests were using the confessional box of the Roman Catholic Church, which is protected by law. It's acknowledged by the states, by the governments, that what goes on in the confessional box of the Roman Catholic Church is sacrosanct. That the Roman Catholic priests, by the duty of their ecclesiastical office must maintain as inviolate whatever takes place in that confessional box. And this is where they led the revolution. This is where they were leading this teaching and, 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 and capturing the minds and the imaginations and raising the furor of Roman Catholics to restore the Pope's temporal power. In the confessional box 
of the Roman Catholic Church. Now think what a danger that same confessional box means to Americans today if the Pope should decide to use the confessional box and the sanctity of the confessional box and his priests in the confessional box to lead the American Roman Catholics to rebel against the popular government of this country and to restore the temporal power of the Pope in the United States. That's exactly what's going to happen. That's exactly what is happening. Now, quote, in criminal defiance of the government, the hearts of women are poisoned against their husbands. The father is cursed to the face of his children. And it is not only in the confessional box that the weaker minds of women are sought to be gained. Importunate epistles and importunate visits are brought into requisition. We see a special danger in the abuse, in the abuse which many of the clergy, the Roman Catholic priests, have already begun to introduce into the religious instruction of the schools. Okay? the confessional box, and now the schools. And it says the child is justly accustomed to look upon its religious preceptor, that is, his teacher and his priest, as an authority. It believes him and obeys him without suspicion or reflection. And these artless and unsuspecting minds are now taught this dangerous new doctrine the doctrine of papal infallibility, that the Pope now speaks with the voice of God, right? And it says the child is told at school that his father, who does not believe, is damned and accursed. The priests denounce infamy and disgrace against those who refuse to submit solemn anathematism. And what is most hurtful, ignominious interment. The refractoriness of the clergy has gone so far, on the Rhine, for instance, that a soldier returned from the war who was about to lead his affianced bride to the altar was not allowed to marry her because his name had appeared on the protest against this dangerous innovation. Unquote. And what was that dangerous innovation? the doctrine of papal infallibility. And here are distinctly shown not only the apprehensions existing in the minds of Roman Catholics in reference to, this, uh, to the effect that this dangerous new doctrine, papal infallibility, upon the faith as they have been taught it, and its threatening aspects toward the political and social foundations of the state, but how that extraordinary instrument of ecclesiastical despotism, the confessional, is employed in fixing this doctrine of the Pope's infallibility in the minds of the young and unsuspecting, in the very faces of all the governments, and in defiance of parental authority. That's how the Pope gets to the children without the parents knowing both through the schools and through the confessional box. They inculcated this de doctrine of demons, this antichrist attitude of the papal infallibility. They indoctrinated the children in the confessional box and in the schools. And it says this same marvelous power is at work in this country, the United States, to enforce at the sacred altar the religio-political opinions already pointed out as so dangerous to the state, so at war with the whole genius and spirit of our institutions, our Protestant institutions, those institutions that the Pope calls liberal and damnable. Now, he says Protestants have not duly considered what a tremendous engine of power this is. How far as an element of absolutism it transcends any other ever invented by human ingenuity. 
They should understand it better, says R.W. Thompson, and I agree. It says the ecclesiastical historians, Sozomen and Socrates, now we're going to talk about the confessional box here, and we've dealt with this many times on Inquisition Update, but let's hear what R.W. Thompson comes up with on this, this, this diabolical institution called the confessional box. He says the, the ecclesiastical historians, Sozomen and Socrates, both inform us that in the 4th century when they wrote, confessions were made in public, thus showing in what light they were regarded by the primitive Christians who lived near the apostolic age. And I've heard even Nicholas talk about this subject on his program, Cross the Border, that in the apostolic age, when a man made confession to men, he made it publicly, not in private to a priest. If a man found himself in sin and God had brought him to repentance and he, set, and he sought to reconcile himself to the body of Christ, he confessed his sins publicly, poured out his heart before the, the, the followers of Christ and sought their forgiveness. It was cleansing. It was holy. And it was divine. But look what the papacy has done to that original form of confession. It says, Sozomen says, this was the custom of the Western churches, particularly at Rome, where there is a place appropriated to the reception of penitents where they stand and mourn until the completion of the solemn service from which they are excluded. That is, they weren't allowed to go to church. They were, they were uh, temporarily put out of the church because of their public sins. And it says, Then they cast themselves with groans and lamentations, prostrate on the ground. The bishop conducts the ceremony, sheds the tears, and prostrates himself in like manner. And all the people burst into tears and groan aloud. Unquote. Penance was then imposed, and after the performance of it, the penitent was, quote, permitted to resume his place in the assemblies of the church, unquote. Do you see what public confession was? It was a way to restore a brother to, to righteousness. When God convicted a man's heart of his sin, of, of a public sin, since the sin was committed in public and it grieved the spirit and it defamed the body of Christ, his admission of sin and his repentance was performed publicly so that the whole body of Christ was edified by it. And the church was more than glad to restore him to full fellowship in the body of Christ. Christ was glorified in that form of confession. Now he says, he continues, quote, The Roman priests have carefully observed this custom from the beginning to this time. While at Constantinople it had been the custom to appoint a presbyter to preside over the penitents. And it says, This early custom, simple and impressive in its form of procedure, recognized the priest only as an intercessor for the penitent by his prayers but gave him no power to impose almsgiving at his discretion as, as a satisfaction for sin. And we'll continue with this description of how the Roman Catholic Church perverted that holy institution of confession, public confession, into private confession and opened up a world of iniquity. I don't want my listeners to get so involved in it that they forget the point that R.W. Thompson is trying to make. R.W. Thompson is trying to impress upon our minds just what abuse takes place in the Roman Catholic confessional box that they were using at this time to raise up the Roman Catholics in rebellion against their duly elected republics, their own governments. Right here in the United States, the confessional box was used to unite Roman Catholics against our form of government, to lead a rebellion, not just in France, but the United States as well. 
but we're segueing into a, a, a little bit broader uh, area of discussion regarding the confessional box and just how corrupt it is. But again, don't lose sight of the fact that the confessional box, given the the protection by law of its sanctity, is an instrument through which the papacy raises rebellions, where the papacy wages war against governments that do not submit to his divine right. And they took an institution which originally during the apostolic age was a public confession. Public sins were publicly confessed, and restoration was publicly given. It was divine. It was blessed. But the Roman Catholic priesthood arrogated confession to themselves, and all of a sudden confessions became private, and the confessional box sprang into existence. Had it not been for the corruption that the Roman Catholic Church put upon confession, the papacy could not use that sanctified little box to raise up these rebellions. This is what happens when Satan counterfeits something holy. He took public confessions, made it private, put a Roman Catholic priest in charge of it, and allowed the Roman Catholic priest to open up a whole new world of iniquity. And that's what we're going to talk about now. Now, speaking of the apostolic age and public confession, the author says this, This early custom, simple and impressive in its form of procedure, recognized the priest only as an intercessor for the penitent by his prayers, but gave him no power to impose almsgiving at his discretion as, as a satisfaction for sin. He had no right to excommunicate and cut off any Christian from fellowship in the church without trial by the church and conviction upon competent evidence. And this practice, insofar as it involved the power of the priesthood, prevailed universally in the Western or Roman church many centuries after Christ. Within that period, however, the practice of giving publicly to confessions was changed. The ambitious Leo I, now here's how the, con the public confession got perverted. It says the ambitious Pope Leo I, who became Pope in 440 A.D., inaugurated a new system in order to increase the authority of the clergy, and consequently the Pope. You see, he had an ulterior motive. He directed that quote-unquote secret confessions should be substituted for that which before had been public and should be made to the priest only and not to the church. There you have it. There you have a whole new world of iniquity sprung upon the world. They made the public confession private, and they gave the priest the sole discretion over the confessional box. And that just compounded the power of the priesthood and thereby the Pope. It was all about power. It was all about gaining information. It was all about raising money for the church and power for the church and taking away that holy, taking away from that holy thing that the apostles practiced, that God's original Christians practiced, public confession. And he continues, he says, but the power of absolution was not extended. That is, the, the, the ability of the priest to absolve a man from his sins, which is not scriptural. It says, but the power of absolution was not extended even by him beyond the petition and prayers of the priest that God would extend his mercy to the penitent and pardon and absolve him from his sins. 
Thus, Gregory I, Pope Gregory I, who did not become Pope until 590 A.D., wrote as follows, uh, wrote as follows to the proconsul Marcellus. Now listen to even further corruption of this Roman Catholic system called confessional. Quote, And since you have asked that our absolution, our absolution, may be given you, it is fitting that you should satisfy our Redeemer with tears and the whole intention of your mind for these things as duty requires. Because if he be not satisfied, if he be not satisfied, what can our indulgence or pardon confer? So the papacy, or, or this, 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 this Pope Gregory I, has just arrogated to himself the power of absolution. Just implied it in his response. And there's where the corruption began that not only now are Christians imposed by this confessional uh, this confession to the priests but absolution is now to be gained not from God but from the priest now what power does the priest have now what power does the pope have the papacy is Antichrist. It irrigates to himself the prerogatives of God. That is the very definition of Antichrist. And there's no better d uh, display of Antichrist than in the confessional box of the Roman Catholic Church and the power that this priesthood exerts over the penitent and what they do with that information. Now, he, he says... As the clergy had not by this early practice the power of pardoning pe penitents and thus to acquire the desired uh, dominion over them, it's all about dominion, isn't it? So as to regulate their thoughts and actions, the system of compounding sins was gradually introduced. In other words, the confessional box didn't make anything better. It made it a world worst a world of iniquity, by compounding sin, sin upon sin. At first, however, at first, however, it at first, however, made slow progress, even in the Middle Ages. In the ecclesiastical laws drawn up in England by Dunstan, Archbishop of Canterbury in 967, when that kingdom was under papal rule, Almsgiving was substituted for the ancient custom of performing penance. The rich were to build churches, and if able, to add manors, build roads and bridges, distribute their property, abandon their lands, their country, and all the desirable things of the world. See, it's all about money, right? A fast of a, a, fast of a day could be redeemed by one penny, there's your indulgences, and of a year by 30 shillings, and so on. In other words, you could buy your way out of penance. This is called indulgence. It's the most money-making prop, uh, proposition in the whole Roman Catholic Church history, that you can buy forgiveness of sins. It's called simony. We see the first example of this in the, in the, in the New Testament, in Acts, and I believe it's chapter 4, where the apostle met face to face with Simon. Simon the magician, Simon the sorcerer, Simon the simoniac. This is where we get the word simony from Simon himself, who thought he could buy the power to lay upon hands and impart the Holy Spirit. He was a, a Babylonian mystic. And people thought that he was, uh, the, he became famous in, uh, in uh, Samaria. And the people thought he was the great power of God. And yet, God reveals him as a phony. When he exposes his own error by seeking to purchase the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Now, this is practiced to this day in the Roman Catholic Church, the power to buy ecclesiastical favor. And forgiveness of sin is just one of those favors, and it is conducted in the confessional box, that world of iniquity. Now, it says, from this principle of making atonement for sin by the payment of money as alms, it was easy to advance another step and give to the priest the same power over sins that God possesses, that is, to absolve the penitent. This step, however, was not finally taken until the 13th century. Yes, it took a long time for Satan to inculcate this world of iniquity because even the consciences of men could see the error of it. He says... This step, absolution, however, was not finally taken until the 13th century when the doctrines of Thomas Aquinas obtained ascendancy. He insisted that penitence is a sacrament, like baptism, and that as the priest in the latter says, I baptize thee, therefore, in the former, I should, uh, he should say, I absolve thee, unquote, thus conferring upon the priest the power of absolution. The argument was convincing to those who desired to possess that power, and they soon began the construction of that system of rules for the government of the confessional, which cannot be read without bringing a blush to the hardest cheek, and which are too immodest for review or repetition. Thomas Aquinas took error and compounded it with more error and turned the confessional box into a porn shop. Yes, I said a porn shop, a P-O-R-N shop. And they began to re write questions that the priest is to ask his penitents in the confessional box where no one can hear probing questions that would make a sailor blush, requirements that both men and women reveal the most intimate areas of their life in graphic detail. Because, you know, if you want full absolutions for your sins, you must make a full confession. And the priest now becomes a voyeur, and the penitent a mindless weeping mass of filth rehearsing before that priest some of the most private sins of a person's life, even those of little girls. That's why these questions can't be published. That's why so many people in this country don't even know about them. It's just too wicked to talk about. Now, the author stops at this point to give us a note about this new direction that the priest, or rather Thomas Aquinas, has taken this world of iniquity, this confessional box. He says, upon this subject, Bishop Hopkins says, quote, it is indeed a point of no small difficulty to ascertain how far it is consistent with propriety to proceed with such documents. For it is certain that they are an inseparable part of the subject, that they form the staple of the Roman confessional at the present day, and are a true but very brief index to the sort of questions which more than a hundred millions of our fellow creatures, male and female, are obliged to answer whatever it pleases the priest to interrogate them. While over the whole of it, excuse me, while over the whole of what takes place in the confessional box, excuse me, while over the whole of what takes place in the confessional box, an impenetrable veil of mystery is thrown. Moreover, these things are not only to be found in the authentic and public councils of the Church of Rome herself, being in fact the official acts of her highest dignitaries, but the same, in substance, are now published in our own language and in our country. 
for the use of the laity and an essential guide to those who come to the confessional. And yet so abhorrent are the feelings of our age toward the open discussion of such topics that no writer can transfer the mere records of Romanism to his pages without incurring the reproach of indecency, unquote. That's from Hopkins, page 193 and 194. Another quote, The Garden of the Soul, a manual of spiritual exercises and instructions for Christians who, living in the world, aspire to devotion, is the title of the work published under the auspices of the Roman Catholic hierarchy in the United States. It has the especial approbation of the Archbishop of New York and may be read, readily procured. It is extensively circ uh, circulated among the laity with the object, as declared in the preface, quote, to instruct the members of the Roman Catholic Church on the nature of the most solemn act of their religion, unquote. And yet, in the, quote, instructions and devotions of confession, that is, in order that a good confession be made, there is language employed which, if it were found in any public newspaper in the United States, would cause the filthy sheet to be cast out from every fireside. Unquote. Page 213. And it says, the celebrated work of Peter Denz, it's entitled Theologia Moralis Dogmatica, contains several numbers in volume four upon this subject, with which I am unwilling to soil these pages, even by the insertion of the Latin. Several years ago in that city, where I re in the city where I reside, a gentleman read and translated these before an audience where there were no ladies and an honest young Roman Catholic layman present was so shocked that he called him to be arrested and carried before the mayor upon a charge of public indecency. Now remember, we're talking about the instructions given to the priest that dictate what questions he shall ask the penitent. And they delve into areas that I can't discuss here on Inquisition Update. First of all, I'd be kicked off First Amendment Radio, and then I would be denounced as a voyeur, as, an un, as, as, as a, uh, a non-Christian. That's how depraved these priests are. Now, the author continues. He said, The reader must examine for himself to see how completely every thought sentiment and intent and faculty of the mind is confided to the priest by the practice of auricular confession, that is, private confessions, and how every action of life, even to the invasion of the domestic sanctuary. What is the domestic sanctuary? The home. And what is the domestic sanctuary of that home? The bedroom. Every action of life, even to the invasion of the domestic sanctuary, is mapped out before him in order that he may process entire, uh, possess entire control over the penitent. That's right. What do you give a priest when you confess everything? You give him control over your life. Because he can blackmail you with anything he wants. Okay? Just the threat. Just knowing that someone of the ilk of a black-robed priest, now so insolent that they can commit... They commit world-class sins against little boys... How far could you trust that priest after you've spilled your guts and the contents of your brain, the contents of the most private area of your life? And just that threat is enough to make that priest a god in your life. He could ruin you. 
And people would believe him, because after all, he's a priest. He's a little Jesus. He must be telling the truth. Now do you see how the priest, through the confessional, controls the kings of the earth? Not only does he control the hearts and minds of little girls and little boys, men and women, wives and husbands, but he controls the kings of the earth with this filth on the threat of blackmail. You see the world of iniquity that involved, that evolved from holy public confession, apostolic confession, to the private auricular confession in the ear of a priest in private under the sanctity of the confessional box and the protection of civil law. A world of iniquity indeed. In this connection, it is only necessary to say further that the Council of Trent in 1551 established the doctrine of Dom Thomas Aquinas as a part of the faith. In other words, it became dogma. By giving the power of absolution to the priest and continuing the system of allowing them, at their discretion, to compound sin for sin by imposing pecuniary penalties, in other words, monetary penalties. You want forgiveness of your sin? You want absolution? Give me money. Lots and lots of money. You know, on the streets, it's called hush money. It's called extortion. But in the confessional box, it's called almsgiving. It's called penance. It's a holy thing, right? <laughs> The doctrine declared by this celebrated ecumenical council is that God never gave to creatures the power to grant remission of sin until the coming of Christ when he became man in order to, now listen to this, in order to bestow on man this forgiveness of sins. When he communicated this power to bishops and priests in the church, having delegated to them his authority for that purpose showing that by the act of the priest in prescribing penance and receiving alms in satisfaction for sin, the sinner is forgiven. And this, although the priest himself may be covered all over with the filth of his own personal corruption. That's right. This system of auricular confession to the, uh, of sin defies... Even the most corrupt conscience. Because everyone knows when they walk into that confessional box, this is a filthy man. He may well be a pedophile himself. He, by all accounts, is an extortioner. He uses the consciences of a human being to draw them into his web. He uses us penitent's own sin to convict him, and then he draws him into his web to suck the life out of them. And then to corrupt their minds with so much filth that after immediately leaving the confessional box, they feel like they ought to confess their sins all over again. The new ones, the ones that were committed in the confessional box. I'm telling you, when a human being begins to grasp the world of iniquity that is enveloped within that confine of the confessional box, taking a shower somehow is inadequate to describe the scum that you feel creeping all over your body. And it's this confessional box that not only is the mind of little girls and little boys corrupted, but it is where kings of the earth are held under extortion and commanded to commit even more violent crimes, and many times directed at God's own people. We'll continue with the papacy and the civil power tomorrow on Inquisition Update. See you tomorrow.